good morning. Morning. It's good to be here. Good to be with you and see some friends and be part of this uh, panel. I'm going to, you know, full disclosure, I, you know, I'm going to be talking about perceptions, so I don't mean to offend anyone. Um, I was first elected as Bill, my friend Bill Lane knows, in a district that went from the south side of Chicago, the Ford Taurus uh, assembly plant, all the way out to LaSalle, Peru, an industrial town. I was a a Republican elected in a district that had always selected Democrats, it was a classic Reagan Democrat district, a district that Ross Perot got almost 25% of the vote in in 1992. So uh, there's been a, you know, a few uh, memories have come back uh, from my first campaign and the, the campaign two years prior, I was just running for re-election to the state assembly in a Democratic industrial district. Um, just the uh, kind of the sentiment, the mood, and of course, uh, perceptions that voters have because as all of us who have ever run for office and been involved in political campaigns, we know that perceptions are reality in a political campaign. So I have some comments on perceptions, but also how I feel that they're going to impact uh, uh, you know, policy going forward. I, you know, we, the last few days, uh, many of us have been on Capitol Hill. I've seen a lot of my uh, friends of both political parties, their staff as well. You know, uh, the House Republicans kind of an extra spring in their step this week, thinking about the opportunity to have a Republican president they can work with on some of the priorities where they agree on. Um, you know, the, my Democratic friends are a little shell shocked, and particularly their staff, many of whom had been measuring the drapes uh, the week before uh, the election. And uh, of course, uh, people are still working their way through uh, the election, what happened. But, as we all know, all the experts, all the smart people predicted that Hillary Clinton was going to win. I remember election night at 7 o'clock, turning on the television, the polls were closing on the East Coast, and all the, the Clinton folks that were on television were pretty smug and pretty boastful, and by 11 o'clock they were pretty at very long faces, trying to see whether or not they were going to get 100 more votes out of Broward County and some of the other corners of the county. So it was quite a surprising election. But one of the clear facts that came out of that is you had millions of people that voted for Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012 that turned around and voted for Donald Trump. So there was clearly a swing. And of course the question is why? And uh, you know, for a lot of Americans, you get outside of uh, the Washington bubble, you get outside of the bi-coastal economy. There's millions of people in the Midwest and uh, the uh, old uh, what we, industrial states and in South, what some people call flyover country, who today have, have feel their standard of living has gone down. They've seen a deterioration in their opportunities, and frankly, they don't feel that the, the Washington elite cares. So they're frustrated, and of course, uh, that attitude is sometimes was called uh, by Franklin Delano Roosevelt the, the forgotten American. Richard Nixon called it the silent majority. Uh, Ronald Reagan, of course, had his Reagan Democrats. And of course, in this last campaign, uh, we, uh, we saw many of those people speak uh, in a very uh, obvious way, uh, producing an unexpected um, election result. But the bottom line is many of these people feel that their standing of living has gone down and that their future is threatened. Uh, the traditional commodity industries, logging, coal, uh, have you know, been seen their opportunities uh, diminished because of government regulation, uh, both international as well as, as local. Uh, traditional manufacturing has changed uh, drastically, and certainly in my generation, you know, just as a result of technology alone, let alone uh, perceived foreign competition. Uh, we see every day uh, a lot of attention paid to the, all the industriousness and effort uh, by companies such as uh, Google and Uber to remove millions more Americans uh, from the economic uh, um, you know, uh, chain by uh, coming up with driverless vehicles. You know, all those taxi drivers you have interesting conversations with and the long haul truck drivers, in 10 years they're not going to have jobs because they could be replaced by driverless vehicles. The question is, what's that going to mean politically? Uh, wh whether or not they have opportunity to replace uh, their role in the economy. That's going to have an impact. And frankly, from a value standpoint, uh, many of these same people feel that uh, the Washington elite have disparaged their religious values. They're concerned that their children are being sent off to public schools and public universities that have become essentially re-education camps 
to kind of take away those values that they grew up with and make them more politically correct. So Donald Trump uh, successfully tapped into that uh, concern. He had tapped into those emotions. And he did it successfully and gave voice uh, to many of those people when they spoke up. And again, I'm talking about perceptions here. But, you know, in, in contrast, you had the, the Clintons, who I certainly served with. Uh, he was my president when I was a freshman, so the Clintons have been part of my life and political life for a long, long time. But many of these same Americans saw, you know, the, you know, the Clintons uh, organizing an enterprise involving, you know, several billion dollars for the foundation and political campaigns, and at the same time, enriching themselves. Um, I think today they have about, you know, written a lot of assets of 160 to 200 million dollars, and of course, when they left office, they were dead broke, as you may recall. And many Americans have. Uh, have been concerned about that. And of course, then WikiLeaks in the final weeks of the campaign really um, revealed kind of the incestuous relationship between politics and media and uh, the leadership here in Washington as well as in the business community. So, you know, you think about it, you know, and again, I'm talking about perception here. Uh, if you watch the, the election coverage, all so often, uh, many in the media would disparage the Trump supporters saying, that, well, you see, the more educated people are, the more likely they are to support Clinton, the less educated people are supporting, are supporting Trump. And many of those people are bigots, and sometimes they call them uneducated bigots. And obviously, you know, in insulting uh, these folks or shaming these folks was, that was not going to convince them to change their position in the vote. Thank you, Mike. Um, so it's uh, been an interesting campaign. And then to put the cherry on top, uh, the Clinton campaign uh, chose to have their candidate spend the last couple days uh, campaigning with the likes of Lady Gaga. Now, when you think about it, when you think of the rhetoric of the campaign between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton in those final couple days, and the images that were being presented to the American people, who seemed more in touch with the average working American? The one who hung out with Lady Gaga? or the one who was talking about a system that seemed to be rigged, and not everybody was able to participate in our system today and to benefit from it. And clearly, the you know, majority of them uh, spoke in the right states, causing uh, Donald Trump to get the electoral votes to win. So this, uh, you know, this campaign that we have today has really turned the politics of trade upside down. You know, as a Republican who represented, a, frankly, a pretty tough district and over time was able to position himself to be what he wanted to be, which was a strong advocate for free trade. It was very involved with ER CAFTA and Chile and Colombia and Panama and Peru. Um, you know, you, you, you get a pretty good feel for some of these issues. But here I am, I'm watching, for the first time in decades, a Republican presidential nominee who's blaming free trade and our trade agreements for our current economic troubles. And there were so many times I felt like I was listening to the president of the AFL-CIO rather than the Republican presidential nominee. Now, Donald Trump carried Pennsylvania and he carried Michigan. You know, Ronald Reagan was the last Republican to carry those states. They haven't carried elected a Democrat to cast votes uh, for a Democrat in almost uh, 30 years. It's been, or excuse me, for a Republican in almost 30 years, 88 being the last one. I guess George Bush the first uh, was the last uh, Republican. But clearly, Donald Trump's position on trade was has been credited with the reason that he carried Michigan and Pennsylvania. So working Americans have kind of become the new uh, soccer moms in American politics. Um, you know, Congress is a reactive body, as is any legislative body. They react to perception. They react to uh, what they see as the concerns of people. Polling data is very interesting, Mike. Um, uh, but the thing is, is that clearly, I think we can expect to see Congress embracing the, the need uh, for greater enforcement of our existing trade agreements as part of, frankly, uh, those of us who support free trade uh, to justify why they're so important and why it's so important to keep in place the trade agreements we have and to continue to strengthen them. You know, we're fortunate to have good advocates uh, in key positions today, Kevin Brady at Ways and Means, and Warren Hatch and Ron Wyden uh, on the Democratic side, who have been good, strong supporters of free trade. 
uh, Chairman Brady has, uh, has talked about the po one point that's often overlooked, that uh, if you criticize NAFTA, you have to recognize that the Trans-Pacific Partnership renegotiated NAFTA, particularly in that mm -hmm. labor and environment, a number of other areas, and we should remind folks of that. But uh, when it comes to TPP, you know, there may be some areas that it can be, uh, can be improved. And of course, uh, Kevin has uh, identified those. I think uh, we in the trade community recognize the importance of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, particularly in our ability for the United States to be globally competitive. I was recently in Korea, and of course, uh, I certainly witnessed a very strong push by our Chinese competition, our friends in China, for their One Belt, One Road initiative. And their goal is to rewrite <coughs> the rules of trade from their standpoint. And of course, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, of course, TTIP with our European friends, that's the desire to continue modernizing and writing the rules of trade from a free market uh, democracy uh, standpoint. So clearly, um, it's important as we continue to move forward to remind our friends. And I, I think the polling will show that if uh, we remind people that China is outside of TPP, it's not part of TPP and that this is part of our efforts to compete with the Chinese effectively at the level of the playing field with the Chinese, um, that I believe that would help with the average voter. But it takes a lot of effort to educate the voters, doesn't it? And I, mean, I used to say to Bill Lane when I was first elected, I said, Bill, what do you, all I noticed, the only people who come to my office and talk to me about free trade wear suits. I never well, had, I blue jeans. Yeah, <laughs> but I never had folks come in who aren't in suits, unless they're farmers. But, you know, we have to rethink how we're going to explain trade. We've got to rethink, and of course the data that Mike shared with us I think needs to be thoroughly, uh, you know, explored by all of us as we rethink um, how we better explain trade from the perspective of the message that came out of this last election. You know, after every campaign, uh, you know, you always learn more about losing than you do about winning. No one likes to lose. Uh, but the same point is, is that you always look at what happens in every campaign and recognize your next one is not going to be the same campaign you just ran. So uh, we need to very carefully look at the, the moods, the opinions, uh, what's the perception of American voters, particularly American workers, and uh, of course how we can navigate that and better communicate why trade and writing the rules of trade so the United States can be competitive is so very, very important. One other item which I think it's important to note uh, that is going to be extremely important for the United States to be Globally, is I believe we really had the perfect storm as a result of this election. Donald Trump called for tax reform uh, during the campaign, and of course his proposal, if you look at it, is pretty much mirrors the, the Republican blueprint that Paul Ryan came up with. So you have the President of the United States, the Speaker of the House, of course Paul Ryan lays awake at night thinking how he can improve the tax code to make it more competitive. And of course uh, Chuck Schumer, the new Democratic <coughs> leader, and Paul Ryan last fall we're very, very close to, uh, to an agreement on international tax reform. And of course, uh, my belief is, is that document is on a shelf waiting to be pulled back out. Um, and the sense is the first 100 days of this new Congress is going to be like the, the class of 94, which I was part of, that, uh, the first 100 days of the contract with America. Very, very busy, and tax reform is going to be at the forefront of that agenda. And the benefit of that is, of course, in the uh, blueprint, is, is that U.S. corporate taxes will be refundable at the border when it comes to the export product that's being sold. So that would no, your corporate taxes would no longer be part of the sales price of that product in very simple terms. That'll be good news, and that'll be very helpful.